Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Michael. So today I'm going to present the work on spatially aware or spatially agnostic cross-device interactions that uh, actually was done in collaboration with my co-workers uh, that I'd like to introduce here. Uh, Hans-Christian Jetter, Mario Schreiner, Chao Lu, Harald Reitra, and Yvonne Rogers. And I especially want to emphasize that the first two authors of this paper collaborated equally. I also would like to thank the, our sponsors from the German Research Foundation and the Intel Collaborative Research Institute who funded this research. So space is a very important cognitive resource and actually during epistemic activities that we researchers do every day, people lay out information in space to externalize and to spatially reflect the current thoughts or to provide a shared space for in-group discussions. And especially for knowledge work, lay out documents in space for reading in order to read and write across documents is very crucial as found by Selen and Harper. But this behavior is also documented for many, many activities. For example, general practices of knowledge work, sense making and analysis of data, ideation in creative design, and group work. But such physical space that cannot be used in a virtual environment as it is offered by traditional applications on computers or laptops. And the interaction in such inherent abstract virtual spaces is very, very different from a well-known interaction in physical space. However, in recent years, the amount of powerful yet mobile computing devices, as you see in the picture, have just exploded. Ah, we will see it. If you look at this image, which was taken in 2005 during the election of Pope Benedict XVI, you sparsely see people using those mobile devices. However, eight years later, at the same location, at the election of Pope Francis, who actually superseded Benedict, we are witnessing an explosive growth of number and density of powerful mobile devices around us. And these devices are ubiquitous and they seem to be well accepted in our everyday life now. And that might be one of the reasons why interaction between uh, multiple mobile devices is an increasingly popular field in, research, in ACI. And uh, it can be regarded as, a, as one incarnation of Mark Weiser's vision of, of ubiquitous computing, in which actually user experiences now really begin to cross device boundaries, and co-located devices can be easily joined to create ad hoc device communities. Ideally, users experience such community as a single and seamless natural user interface that actually is flexible enough in its use and it's not restricted to a uh, few possible configurations or predefined sequences of use. And applications of cross-device interaction, they have become uh, increasingly popular and diverse and now uh, range from user interfaces that actually span across multiple displays. We've seen applications for sharing photos between a small group of people that use their own mobile phones. There have been systems that were designed for multi-slate systems that support active reading and cross-device interactions uh, through conduit gestures where uh, the user actually acts as a conduit to transfer objects uh, from a source device to a target device. And last year, Kai, there was a, a, a sense-making system for sense-making tasks to share information and manage sessions and chain tasks across devices actually using spatially agnostic, so non-spatial menus to select target devices. And this one is actually our, includes our own work uh, on HuddleLamp, which uses a low-cost RGBD camera to actually identify multiple mobile uh, devices on a table and also check their location and orientation in uh, sub-centimeter precision. So, however, the appropriate design of cross-device interaction is still an open question, and uh, with all different competing approaches, such as the synchronous gestures, spatially aware, and spatially agnostic gestures. And this is another complete list. There is uh, much, much more that go is going on in cross-device interactions. And especially the availability of new low-cost sensing technologies that calls for more research on spatially aware versus spatially agnostic cross-device interactions. So the questions that actually drove our research are, and I'm reading it to you uh, because for some of you it might be too small. So, the questions are how to design the details of cross-device interaction between multiple devices 
uh, between mobile devices so that they be, uh, become easy to learn and easy to use? And what role should increasingly popular technologies for sensing spatial configuration and detecting mid-air gestures actually play in, in their design? Should interactions follow a traditional yet robust non-spatial model? For instance, like menu-based selections? So this is what our work contributes. Our work uh, gives insights into elicited user-defined gestures for cross-device interactions. And it presents a consecutive controlled lab experiment to gain insights about the ergonomics and the cognitive demand of proposed cross-device gestures. It's very important to notice that our work substantially differs from previous work in two respects. So the first one is we are not primarily interested in one single ideal and optimal gesture set, but rather in a great breadth of user suggestions and deep insights into users' underlying thinking and the metaphors. And the second point is we do not stop at eliciting gestures, but we also evaluate them in a controlled experiment to actually learn about their cognitive and ergonomic properties using, uh, uh, during repeated use. And this, uh, this approach was proposed by Nielsen et al. And it actually aims for the design of an intuitive and ergonomic gestural interface. It, it tries to avoid arbitrary gesture sets that are optimized for reliable recognition uh, by technology and rather than, the, than for use of learning and use by humans. And in addition to that, uh, the Nacenta et al. also argue that user-defined gestures preferred by users are easier to remember. So starting with the gesture elicitation, for the gesture elicitation study, we created a set of uh, 19 cross-device tasks. And the tasks were extracted from cross-device systems or other elicitation studies that happened before, but I'll explain the tasks in a minute. Um, our approach also, our approach of eliciting uh, user-defined gesture also differs from previous work. And we hope to reduce legacy bias, which was found by Morris et al., using their concepts of partners, production, and priming. And we set groups of four to five partners instead of just a single person. And we had four groups of 17 participants in total. And to overcome the production, participants had to suggest at least three, gestu uh, at least three gest gestures instead of one. And also an introductory video with different technologies for cross-device interactions was shown to, uh, to the participants in the beginning in order to prime participants. And of course, all sessions were video recorded for later video analysis. So each task that you see here involved a, so a source and a target device. And the source and target devices is indicated by the arrow. And tasks also differ in near and far devices, which means that near devices are in, uh, within the reach of uh, user's arm. And we also divided the task or categorized the tasks in different uh, groups. The first one is moving an object or moving a file from one device to another one. The second group is copy a file from one device to another one or copy a group of files from multiple tablets to one uh, target device. Duplicate the screen or part of a screen and also duplicate the entire screen on another device. Open a file. Connect peripheral hardware like a keyboard for instance. And also expand the view on another device. So for each task the group had to select their favorite just cross device technique. And we also uh, asked participants on the agreement of the favorite gesture using a questionnaire in order that they are satisfied with the selected favorite. We took all the 60, uh, 76 gestures and categorized them in the synchronous, spatial diagnostic, and spatially aware techniques. And the left bar, uh, the left bar actually shows that 71% of these um, favorite gestures were spatially aware. Uh, which is quite interesting. And so we checked if the predominance of the spatially aware interactions in the, in the, on the left was actually due to the many cross di display object movement tasks that we had in our task set by just excluding these tasks. And uh, in the middle and the center uh, bar, you see uh, those non-object movement tasks. And still the spatially aware interactions were again the most popular tasks. So this clearly indicates how strongly participants or we human associate cross-device tasks 
with interactions in space and how much uh, their thinking and suggestions are of a spatial nature. If you want to mo know more about this, uh, refer you to the paper. There's uh, more detail on that. We also, we did not stop at just eliciting the, the gestures. Uh, so we decided to go a little bit further and explore cross-device interaction techniques. So we implemented two spatially aware and one spatially agnostic. It's a menu-based cross-device technique to, and compared both approaches, spatially aware and spatially agnostic, in a controlled experiment. So this is the first technique. It's a non-spatial or spatially agnostic menu, and here the devices are color-coded, as you can see. And by tapping a share button on an object, opens a list of color target device proxies. And by tapping one of, uh, one of these proxies, it moves the object to the corresponding uh, target device. The other, the first spatially aware technique, is the radar view, which opens a miniaturized top-down view uh, showing colored proxies of current device configurations. And the radar view actually can be activated by dragging and dropping an object onto the radar view button, which is located on the bottom right, for instance. And tapping on the device proxy, it moves the object from, uh, from the source device to the target device. And the second spatially aware technique that we implemented is, uh, we call it edge bubbles. It indicates target devices through colored semicircles around the edges of the screen. And by uh, dragging and dropping an object on one of these circles, it actually uh, moves the object from the source device to the target device. So here are the three implemented techniques in action. And uh, the top right is a spatially agnostic menu. At the bottom left, it's the uh, spatially aware radar view, and on the bottom right, it's the edge bubbles, also spatially aware. i just give you a second to watch uh, through the techniques. And for the experiment, we recruited 12 participants and set the study as a within subjects design, so every participant had to use uh, all three interaction techniques. And also participants had to perform three tasks, which were duplicating a current view of a document on a local tablet to, on a remote, uh, to a remote tablet, selecting a piece of text from the current document on the local tablet and actually copy it to the, room, the remote tablet. And the third task was selecting an object on the local tablet and moving it to the remote tablet. And each task was repeated 48 times in, a, in each condition and for each task, which actually resulted in 5,000 or over 5,000 trials. <clears throat> so these are the results. Um, yeah, instead of letting you decipher the graphs, I'm just going to explain the main findings. But if you're still interested in the graph, you'll also find it in the paper. So these are our findings. The spatially aware techniques, they proved to be favored by users if, even after many, many repetitions. And the popularity of spatially aware techniques during the elicitation study in the first phase is also reflected in our second, in our second phase. However, it is not possible to actually generalize from, from this to all spatially aware techniques, as you'll see in a minute. So a potential explanation that we have for why edge bubbles is clearly superior to the radar view in our experiment is that the cognitive load of mentally mapping a virtual proxy on the screen to a real world counterpart. So to use the radar view, users actually must locate the destination target on the map or vice versa. And this actually requires uh, mentally switching from a natural egocentric view to the top down view of, of, uh, of the uh, constellation. And this switch can also be demanding, as of course we all know from uh, map navigation or from floor plans. And it also resonates with the user comments that edge bubbles is very, very intuitive because uh, proximity and direction are clear and natural and were also considered immediately appealing and most intuitive. However, the mental load of switching between the egocentric and the non-egocentric view seems to diminish the benefits of the radar view in relation to the spatially agnostic menu. And it also becomes very evident uh, in the absence of a significant differences in frustration for all three tasks. And also while the radar view actually helps to identify devices faster when the spatial configuration for the user is unknown or very dynamic, uh, the performance of the menu improves over time. 
uh, until users actually have internalized the mapping of the colors of the tablets. And using the menu, menu then only requires a sequential scanning of a one-dimensional list of color-coded objects, while the radar view still requires to mentally switch be between the egocentric view and, and the top-down view. And this also explains why, uh, in our case, the menu is faster than the radar view in the last task three, and that there are no differences anymore in the mental demand and also in the effort for task two and three. So I'm just summarizing up. Um, so users actually uh, expect cross-device interactions uh, to be spatially aware, as we've seen in the elicitation study, with over 71% of suggested cross-device just as being spatially aware. Uh, that spatially aware cross-device interactions outperform spatially agnostic techniques, but only if they're designed with great care, and which actually connects to, this, to the third point, which is spatially aware techniques eventually can be more cognitive demanding than spatially agnostic techniques, as we have seen with the spatially aware radar view uh, compared to the non-spatial uh, menu. And, of course, spatially agnostic techniques, like the menu, can be a good alternative or even an equivalent to spatially agnostic techniques. So that's my talk, and I'd like to thank you, and I'm also looking for <laughs> possible postdoc positions, and yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Hi, Sangoko from KAIST. Uh, thank you for a great talk, and um, I love the um, bubble technique. Um, I have two questions. Actually, first one is, um, is there a good way to locate um, different devices in indoor condition? And another one is, um, is there a, um, yeah, have you ever thought about um, the overlap problem? Um, for example, if, I, if I'm in the kitchen and I'm having a mobile phone on my hand, and if I have other devices on my desk, and the bubbles will be overlap in the same direction. So is there any considerations mm -hmm. for that kind of situation? Yeah. So uh, concerning your first question, uh, there is many, many technologies that you could use. Uh, if you want to uh, use high precision technologies, and it can, for, you, for instance, use motion tracking systems and stick markers to devices, so you have a really precise location. On the other hand, uh, last year IT at ITS, uh, we presented a work, it's called Huddle Lamp, where you actually can use off-the-shelf devices uh, that you put on a table and a camera above the table uh, allows to track these devices in a kind of a sub-centimeter precision, so the location and the orientation. Uh, and to your second question, in the edge bubbles technique, uh, the distance of the devices was also reflected in the size of the bubbles. So uh, the farther away the device was, the smaller the bubble gets, and these bubbles are on top uh, of the larger bubbles, so you can actually uh, tap uh, both, both bubbles, uh, if they're in one line, for instance. Mm. Okay, thank you. Hi, Paweł Wozniak from Chalmers. Uh, amazing work and super needed for all those of us working in spatial awareness. I have a sort of a trivial question, but I, I want to raise the issue because it was evident in Conductor last year and also in your work. You use spatial, uh, use for, for the spatial interaction, you use the color coding. Well, I'm colorblind, and so in your designs, have you considered alternatives for that? Yeah, uh, we also were aware of that these techniques, especially the non-spatial techniques, won't work for colorblind people. And that's also a reason why probably spatially aware techniques could work, because it's only indicating the direction. Um, I mean, some, if you illustrate in graphs, for instance, uh, if you print graphs in your paper, you also use uh, patterns on for the bar charts, and for instance, this could be one possible solution. Um, but this was not focused in our work, and I'm, I'm I'm truly aware that this is a big problem for um, cross-device interaction techniques, yeah. Thanks a lot. Hey, Jeff Nicholas from Google. Um, so I, I'm curious, I guess, how you think your results would change if you take into account, like, really non-regular placements, which kind of gets to the first, mm -hmm. um, the, the first question, but then also, like, errors in the, in the spatial tracking system, because it seems like, I mean, I totally believe your results here, but if the layouts are really irregular mm -hmm. or the system is just wrong, mm -hmm. you know, I would expect the results are probably greatly different. The, the interesting part is that the users were allowed to actually move the devices 
Uh, Did so they? align the devices. We, we, we allowed them to do that, okay. but actually none of the groups or none of the participants actually did that. Uh, and we also, uh, instead of using these uh, motion tracking systems, which, which allow us to precisely track devices, we used HuddleM, which is one of a low-cost technologies that could possibly be employed in the wild uh, to also co compensate for like uh, tracking failures and all that stuff, which actually uh, wasn't a problem in the, in the study. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, um, let's thank uh, Roman Redle again. Thanks for the presentation.